So let me get started with a couple of, uh, with basically this uh, simple statement here. What is the purpose of HVAC systems? So it's mainly used, uh, you know, to create a comfortable environment at the end of the day. And its applications, there's a lot of applications, uh, which, you know, I'll be talking about. But in general, the main purpose of HVAC system is to make sure you have your temperature, humidity, air movement, fresh and clean air is present and noise levels are controlled in any type of environment. Now this could be an office, this could be a mall, it could be a stadium or it could be a passenger car. All right, so anywhere you have uh, these type of control parameters which you need to optimize, you know, you would basically call that as an HVAC system. All right, so based upon these uh, five points, can anyone tell me, and again, this is primarily intended, this question is primarily intended towards beginners. So can anyone give me examples of HVAC systems that they have encountered? What are some examples where HVAC systems are installed and where HVAC systems have to be engineered properly so that it provides the right it provides a comfortable environment. Can someone give me some examples? A duct design. Okay, that's a very specific example. All right. I, I was more looking, I was looking for, you know, a big picture idea. For example, like a car or hospitals, exactly. Right? Cars, hospitals. What else? If you have large, large public gathering spaces, you know, those are areas where controlling temperature, humidity, air movement fresh and clean air is quite hard. And also noise level is also part of the HVAC system. Any, any for example, um, any uh, air handling equipment that you use should not provide a lot of noise. And nowadays as part of the, as part of engineering the environment, soundproofing is also being part of making a comfortable environment. Data center, exactly. That's a very good answer. So data centers are basically places where large computing units are maintained. So for example, companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, they process all their data through these data centers. And thermal management in these data centers is very important. In these data centers, you don't have a lot of uh, human beings sitting and walking around all the time. It's mostly these machines and the priority there is to make sure that the, these machines are operated at a comfortable temperature, right? And in those cases, the HVAC design or our optimization objectives are completely different, but that's a great example. So what we are going to be doing today is, we are going to be starting from scratch and describe, we are going to be describing the fundamental blocks of HVAC system. Now, any HVAC system that you can take, it could be of any system, it has these five, five subsystems, okay? So this could be the HVAC system in your car or it could be a hospital, it doesn't matter. It could be a data center, it doesn't matter. It contains these five units. Now, any type of HVAC system configuration can be explained with these five units, but not all of them necessarily have these five units. So understanding these five units is all about, is what HVAC engineering is all about. So if you're understanding these systems, if there's a particular subsystem that you're interested in, you know, you can see that there are, if there are any projects in that area, and you can start working on that. So basically it's air side system, chilled water system, refrigeration system, heat rejection, and then control system, right? This seems very simple. So we are just going to break down each of these systems, go step by step, and then talk about how these sub parts or subsystems are optimized using computer simulations. So first let's take a look at the air system, right? So this is called as, this is also called as the air side loop. This is probably the easiest thing to understand. So for example, let us say that you are in a small room and then this is the supply air and then you have a, you, have, you basically have a duct through which return air goes and whatever supplies this air forms the air loop, right? So you're supplying in air and you're returning air back to the atmosphere. This is the air side loop. What's the objective here? You have some, you have a space where you're trying to control temperature and humidity, right? That is what you call as the condition space. Now, a very good air system should make sure that it, when it is set at a particular point, which is called as the set point, it needs to make sure that if there is too much moisture or too much sensible heat, it removes it. Or if it's, if there is less sensitive sensible heat and less moisture, it adds it. 
so that is basically a, the characteristic of a perfect perfectly working air side loop right so again if you look at this particular drawing here it makes a lot of sense so let me just use my annotation tool here give me a second so for example let us say that this is your condition space and you are trying to keep it at 23.9 degrees celsius so you have your supply fan which is going to pass through the uh, pass through air and then what's going to happen is this air is going to come out so sas stands for supply air ra stands for return air and ea stands for exhaust air can anyone try to guess what ma is does anyone know what ma is any guesses not not mist air though okay not moisture it's mixed air right so what you basically do is uh, you need to understand that it, like you know for example when you're in even in your house when you're having air conditioning right some amount of cool air escapes right so if there is a way to kind of use that and reuse that then there is always there is definitely an efficiency point there so what you do is a part of the mixed as a 25% or 30% of the return air is basically fed back into the in intake circuit oa stands for your outer air that's the freshest air that you can get but that is usually at a higher temperature and your return air is usually at a less temperature so when you mix it you know you basically save some energy and that's why there is a mixing circuit so this is a very simple air side circuit okay so let me just uh, go back to my annotated tool clear all my drawings all right so then here comes an important question right so how do you cool like for example here my um, here i want to make sure that my room is at 23.9 degrees celsius then my supply air is coming in uh, my my outer air is at 95 degree fahrenheit or 35 degree celsius and then when i'm mixing it obviously i'm cooling it a little bit but i'm not cooling it exactly to the amount that i want and hence what you do is in hvac system you you basically put a cooling coil can anyone tell me what another name for cooling coil is just from the picture that i've shown here cooling coil is nothing but it's a very popular mechanical device what is it called as no it's not a throttle it's not a condenser it's basically a heat exchanger exactly shivam so cooling coil is basically a heat exchanger which reduces the temperature of your mixed air to something like 12.8 degrees celsius right this is just an example it is not something that every you know every system out there does okay all right so then that brings us to an excellent question right okay so we are using uh, we are using a cooling coil we are reducing uh, the temperature of the air to 12.8 degrees but then how do i use that to control the temperature right that's because it, this is 12.8 and in my room i want 23.9 well that is where you have this unit called as the vav does anyone know what vav stand for <coughs> okay so let me just explain that so vab vav stands for variable air volume so basically this is what you call as an air flow modulation device so what it does is uh since it's 12.8 degrees celsius right by controlling the amount of cool air you can essentially regulate the temperature in this particular room right so 12.8 is kind of the minimum temperature that you can achieve provided that this is at max max throttle open but by adjusting the throttle position you can actually control the temperature in this room so this is called as the vav terminal unit now why am i explaining these subs subsystems individually like because as you will see in a few more slides the entire picture is actually very very complex it's it's really large and we are actually starting from a very simple approach and then we are slowly adding in components so that we are comfortably able to understand the global idea and that will help you understand and appreciate how complex an entire hvac system is okay so now let's talk about packaging right so though this particular diagram helps us understand everything in reality all of this is actually put and packaged into a single device right so this is like uh, 
a very good amount of engineering that they do to get this done. So for example, this is how your outlet air dampers are, your air filters are located here, your supply fan is here, your cooling fan is here, and your supply air, this is where you get your supply air, right? So everything is completely packaged and uh, highly modular. Okay, so moving on. So now this is what your air handling unit is, right? So AHU, yes, exactly, that's correct, Shivam. So you have your air handling unit here, and this is how this is placed in, say for example, in a large office or in a large auditorium, depending on you know uh, what type of architectural constraints you have, these ducts are dif designed differently, right? But this uh, air handling unit and your uh, ducts and diffusers are systems that will always be there. Only the shape of the duct and how it is actually turned will change. So you have your air handling unit and then you have diffusers. Now diffusers job is to make sure that the cold air is gradually spread into the room and uh, it's, it, it's not because you don't want a cold jet hitting you in the face, right? So that's why you have this diffuser. And this is kind of uh, the architecture of, uh, this is architecture of the air side loop. This is just the air side loop. You're not talking about anything else. Okay, and this system can be pretty large depending upon the building. Okay, so the next thing that we have to talk about is how, the, how does the cooling coil work? As I mentioned, it's a heat exchanger, right? And this is where your next subsystem comes in, which is called as the chilled water loop. And here the idea is quite simple. So if the cooling coil needs to remove heat, right? So for example, what it's doing is it's taking 27.8 degrees air and it's cooling down to 12.8, right? So it's removing some amount of heat. So this heat needs to be rejected somewhere. And that heat rejection is taken by your cooling, um, by your chilled water loop. And basically what it does is it takes air at, uh, you know, example 5.6, sorry, water comes into the cooling coil at 5.6 degrees Celsius and it comes out at 13.9 degrees Celsius. And uh, the increase in temperature is because it's removing heat from your uh, conditioned space. Okay. And if we keep on expanding this, right? Where does this go, right? So this in this circuit, you just have water involved. But then what happens is, how is the heat removed? Or how is the chilled water chilled? Like how is the chilled water, how is the cold water cold, right? Well, that is because you have something called as evaporator, which is nothing but another heat exchanger. The only difference is here, you actually have cooling taking place through a refrigerant. All right. And obviously you will need a control valve and a pump to make sure that all of this process just operates continuously. Because if you don't have a pump, you will not be able to feed, uh, <clears throat> feed your chilled water back into the cooling coil. All right. So similarly, next, if we move on, then you will have your uh, refrigerant loop. So in your refrigerant loop, you have a similar unit, basically a compressor. And there's another important component, which I'll ask as a question to make sure that your refrigerant flow is maintained. All right. So what happens is uh, across the evaporator, right? So you have 38, point, uh, 38 degrees Fahrenheit before the evaporator and after the evaporator, the temperature increases to 10. And then you have the compression, compression process, which increases the temperature to 120 Fahrenheit or 48 degrees Celsius. That's a lot. So what's going to happen is, if you go to the next slide, you have a condenser. The condenser is there and the condenser is going to cool your refrigerant back to 43.3 degrees Celsius. It's not a lot, but it does cool it. But how do I get the temperature of your uh, refrigerant from 43 to three? Does anyone know? Yes, exactly. So that's your expansion valve, right? Again, uh, undergraduate students might find it a bit hard to kind of follow through, but you might have studied expansion valves when you are studying about refrigeration cycles. So just try to put it all together, right? And then you have your expansion valve across which a large pressure drop occurs because of which temperature drops drastically. And then you end up with a 3.3 degrees Celsius uh, just before the evaporator. Okay, so now finally, finally, if you look at it, you still need another cooling loop to make sure that you are taking heat away from the condenser here. So there is, you can see that there is a lot of heat rejection. There is Q here, another Q here, 
and then there is another queue here and this queue is basically removed using a cooling cooling tower which we might have all uh, heard about right and this is like this system is not at complete so if i keep moving on top of all of this i actually have my control loop so this is basically the entire structure of any type of uh, hvac system it could be in your car or it could be in a building it is just that in certain places you you don't have certain components for example in a car you don't have a cooling tower right and why do you need a control well if it's a building then all of these devices can be several meters long all right it can be several meters long like literally in that case how do you make sure that when 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 the user just changes the temperature of the thermostat in its room all of the system work in sync well that is basically your system level controller if your system level controller does not exist you have to manually go and change everywhere come back to the room make sure that the temperature is correct <clears throat> and kind of redo the process with the system level controller you have all the data in one place and the control system that has been coded or programmed will take care of uh, you know making sure that the user set temperature has been reached in an effective manner okay all right so now so hopefully at this point you are all comfortable with uh, you know how a hvac system works so at this point i would like to ask another question so how our hvac simulation or our hvac system simulated right actually it's not a question for you guys i'll just ask a different question but the natural thing that natural question that automatically comes to everyone is how our hvac component simulated well there are two types of simulations that you do and this is where uh, you know depending upon the company and depending upon how large the company is you can have several teams that are working on on a component level or you can have a single team which works on multiple components that typically depends upon the budget of the company and the budget the company allocate towards research and development so if you look at component level analysis you know you can basically separately design heat exchangers compressors pumps and valves all right or you can do something called as a full system simulation and this is where things get very very complex so you can do several types of analysis and computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis are used heavily in these particular areas and we are going to be focusing on that next so for example let us let us take any heat exchanger so when i'm basically using a heat exchanger right so in in the example that i showed before i am talking about uh, you know cooling coils i'm talking about evaporators so what is what are some of the important parameters that i need to take into account while designing a heat exchanger all depends on cfm that's that's correct so that's true that's true shivam but uh, so now let's talk about heat exchangers <clears throat> so for heat exchangers what are the things that you look at exactly um you look at convective heat transfer yes that's correct what else do you look at the fouling factor exactly kedar did you mention that you are a student or are you currently working or oh, you are doing your mtech right kedar okay so i think that's why kedar is answering all the questions uh is my voice is not clear um said i uh, you might have to check uh your audio because i think my voice is clear okay so when you're talking about a heat exchanger right so there are a couple of things so basically a heat exchanger makes sure that it removes excess heat so we saw that as an example in the cooling coil and also when you're talking about the evaporator now one thing you need to understand is uh, when you put a heat exchanger you basically encounter additional pressure losses okay so that is an important consideration to make meaning uh, for example if you have an if you have pressure here say uh, p we we have a static pressure here then at the outlet the static pressure will be different it's going to drop because of the flow paths and the materials that are being used in your heat exchanger right 
why is this pressure law why is this pressure law important can anyone tell me maybe someone other than uh, <laughs> kedar because i think kedar is answering all the questions Avishek Kumar CFM abbreviation uh, Avishek if you are an undergraduate student you should know what CFM is maybe i'll ask that as a question does anyone know what CFM is exactly right it's just a flow rate right so to maintain a particular flow rate when you do a system level you do a system level level simulation to make sure that your a particular flow rate is maintained and you know component level efficiency so in a heat exchanger you do several things so first is you know you make sure that you run the flow simulation so that you get a particular pressure drop and then you can also estimate what your exit temperature is right you can estimate what your exit temperature is and you can basically uh, measure what is the capability that your heat exchanger offers to remove the heat which is called as your heat uh, heat transfer coefficient your convective heat transfer coefficient all right so then you will have pumps and compressors throughout your hvac systems right it is this is mainly for moving fluid around now with respect to pumps uh, uh, i'm not sure if any of you attended our attended our uh, workshop on uh, turbo machinery so i'll have to repeat some content from over there with respect to pumps and compressors you are looking at something called as performance and uh, something called as impeller loading right so the company that makes all these hvac systems like the company that assembles or basically builds your or builds and designs your hvac system is not going to be looking at pumps right they are going to be they are going to be buying pumps from a different manufacturer so if you are working for a pump company and if your customers are hvac if your customers build hvac systems then you will have to build or design pumps to make sure that it produces flow rate and it produces flow rate and it produces that flow rate at a particular pressure rate okay and this is called as the pump performance curve so the pump performance curve is basically the relationship between the head produced by the pump and uh, the flow rate so the curve typically looks something like this and here you actually have a point at which you operate the pump does anyone know what this point is called as it's not called as the peak it's called as the bep point which is called as the best efficiency point okay so say that your client is building hvac system and they are giving you a particular value of head and particular pressure uh, pressure rate and flow rate that they want so you will basically if you are a pump manufacturer you have several pumps right uh, for different flow rates and for different cost obviously <laughs> so you are going to basically pick a particular pump along with the impeller trim that basically gives them that requirement and the, and if you are a guy who designs pumps then you will have to make sure that you run simulations to make sure that your pump lasts for a long time and that's where you look at performance curve and impeller loading so for example this is one of the cfd simulations that i that i recently completed for a centrifugal pump right so i'll just let it play and maybe just pause it somewhere here okay so this right here is what you call as a computational fluid dynamic simulation so we are actually simulating the flow through a centrifugal pump and we are doing a transient flow analysis why is it called as a transient flow analysis because you can see that the impeller is rotating right as a function of time and as the impeller rotates it's pushing the fluid as you can kind of see here right so what people look at is they here i'm is this through ansys fluent well no we actually use a different software to do this ansys fluent is not great with transient flow analysis so we use something called as converge um coming back here so here what i will do is uh, in this particular case i can actually i'm sh i'm showing velocity here but i can easily look at pressure and then i can basically look at these points these trailing edges and uh, can anyone tell me from basic fluid mechanics what is the phenomenon that goes in these areas 
what phenomenon happens in these areas in these circled regions what vortex yes but the answer is still far away from what i want kedar in a pump what is the biggest problem that you can happen that that you can have it starts with c <laughs> cavitation exactly right exactly so cavitation actually happens because of flow separation caused by the geometry so impellers are typically have sharp trailing edges and because of that what's happening is the flow separates and you will you will have a vortex structure kedar okay? so you are right but because of that vortex vortex structure your static pressure in the fluid will drop and your local pressure will be less than the which pressure can anyone tell me your local fluid pressure would be less than dash to cause cavitation so can anyone fill in the blanks what should this be vapor pressure exactly so at that particular fluid temperature there is a vapor pressure if my local pressure is less than that vapor pressure cavitation will be formed i'm assuming that most of the undergraduate students in the call know the answer for it but and are choosing not to answer if you do not know the answer then you should definitely go back and brush your fluid mechanics uh, basics all right so let me clear everything so why would why would i have to do a cfd simulation like this right well the answer is quite simple now one of the things that people want to make sure is from a design point of view right to a particular extent you can kind of limit cavitation by clever designs by doing a lot of geometry optimization work using computers you can actually design impellers that do not cavitate as much as an old generation impeller design all right so these type of things are what you know the r&d department in a company focuses on so if you if you work in in a pump company and you're tasked with kind of you know building a better impeller this is what you would do all right so these type of simulations are all done using computational fluid dynamics there are several softwares at the end of the day which software you use yes it does matter to a certain extent but what is more important is you understand the basics in cfd and you are able to set it up by using the appropriate physical models for example in this case the flow is turbulent there is a cavitation and the, when cavitation takes place how are you going to capture cavitation you know those are things for which you have to make engineering you have to make a uh, judgment based upon you know the theory and experimental data all right so the next thing we need we need to talk uh, is convert simulation software coding in convert simulation software coding is required no not at all uh, you don't have to yes there is a user defined function for example when i did this uh, centrifugal pump simulation kedar i did not have to do any kind of coding you can do it as it is that's one of the power of the software whenever there is moving parts it it can it can do it can simulate things it can simulate those very easily and accurately <coughs> so the next type of devices that you encounter in a hvac system is valves so you have control valves basically flapper valves pressure relief valves uh, sometimes ball valves check valves uh, throttle valves you have so many types of valves and valves not only occur in hvac systems right there is important safety device correct so pressure relief valves for example when you when you are trying to simulate that again computational fluid dynamics and 1d coding uh, using matlab is a very great way to optimize your valve performance so when you are designing a valve what are the things that you look at so let me just play this simulation in here you can see that flow is taking place as the flow takes the direction and it was that's a issue is this oh just a second let me see if i can fix okay so how about now guys is my voice better
just a second guys i'm just going to make sure that i can i'll just be uh, stopping the screen share temporarily okay how about now is my voice better okay perfect all right sorry about that i had a lot of windows open and i think uh, some of them had active internet connections okay so this right here like i said is a val so what are some of the things that people look at a val well in this case you can see that the valve is actually kept at a stationary position so if i open it again and maybe just bring it to the middle okay doesn't seem like oh there we go so let me just pause it over there that should be enough so here as the flow is coming in and where was where is my annotate tool right there as the flow is coming in it imparts a particular pressure so this this valve is actually colored by pressure so that is why you have high pressure here and you have low pressure here uh, red is high blue is low and this pressure this pressure translates into a force and in your real uh, pressure relief valve you actually have a spring you have a spring spring which is basically uh, uh, exerting a force downward which prevents the valve from opening if the fluid pressure is greater than that pressure some amount of pressure is going to be uh, released that is a that is the operation of a pressure relief valve now one of the things that you look at is you basically look at flow characteristics meaning uh, you can basically create a pressure uh, put a pressure sensor here and uh, Okay, sides. Sides is mentioning that there is something crackling with my voice. Uh, guys, is anyone else facing that issue? I hope not. If you are facing the okay, thank you, Kedar. Thank you for your reply. Okay, guys, I need a few more people to reply so that I know for sure that my audio is okay. so the guys who basically typed in yes are you saying that my audio is okay or i am having problems with it okay cool thank you all so here what i can do is i can put a static pressure sensor virtually meaning in a simulation what i can do is this right here in a simulation is called as a computational mesh right in each of these cells you actually have something called as the governing flow equations so what are the governing flow equations you have the mass balance momentum balance and energy balance so you can take all of these equations and solve it in this particular computational cell and what would be the output well you would get the velocity components the pressure and temperature right so what i can do is i can put a static pressure sensor which is a virtual sensor meaning through computer programming i can put a sensor which records the pressure as a function of time and i can basically use that pressure data to estimate what is the fluctuation in my pressure so this is what you would call as flow characteristics valve pressure loading is nothing but the amount of force so when uh, when the fluid pressure acts like this what's the force that's getting developed you can measure that then obviously pressure drop right your valve is a flow control device which means you are going to get a lot of pressure losses in other words if you are using a pump your pump needs to overcome this pressure loss right so that is very important and obviously um, if it is an evaporator sometimes you look at uh, isentropic efficiencies and things like that just to make sure that how much energy is being lost okay all right so then we were i think at this point we are ready to talk about system level simulations so this is one of the simulations that was set up using solid works and what we are actually having here is we are you know you don't have to worry about what type of building this is let us just say that this is some type of a building you have individual rooms here and you have a you have basically a, a handling system here right uh, and you have these ducts which basically take air through different channels and it's basically uh, sending air to each and every room so what you can do is you if you solve the mass equation the continuity equation the momentum equation the energy equation and the turbulence equations uh, which is called as the turbulence modeling turbulence model then you will be able to predict accurately if your mesh is correct what is the temperature and what is the temperature distribution and what is the temperature disparity in the room 
So this is these are some things which you can do very easily with simulations, and they are quite accurate. Uh, so, for example, if you feel like uh, in a particular room, you feel like in certain areas it's hot and certain areas it's cold, that means your uh, that means the incoming air is not getting well mixed, right? So in that case, you can actually use CFD to maybe come up with clever solutions so that you diffuse air in all directions and you keep on oscillating this process to get a uniform mixture, right? And you can mathematically calculate this discomfort by calculating the standard deviation in temperature. Meaning if you, again, this might be, a, this might be a bit technical at this point, but what you can do is in this particular room, you can take the temperature at each and every point. And if you're calculating standard deviation, if the deviation is very high, that means that there are certain areas in the room where temperatures are higher than the mean or the lower or lower than the mean, right? Which is bad for you. You don't want that. Typically, if uh, you need a comfortable environment, the temperature should be uniform and your cooling system can be designed so that you achieve that. And this is what you call as a system level simulation. And finally, uh, oh, and here's an example for this. So let me just play this video and hopefully it won't, there won't be a lot of disturbance. So this right here is what you call as uh, thermal management in a data center. And uh, to be specific, does anyone know what type of containment system is being used here? Any guesses, guys? Does anyone know what type of containment system is this? I know that this is a tough question, but if you can answer, that would be awesome. You can see that there is high temperature here, high temperature here, and high temperature here. Low temperature here and low temperature here. Does anyone know what what the system type is? Again, guys, if anyone can guess. Uh, no, no, no answer is bad answer. So please guess. And I hope you're all able to hear me. So what are these circulated areas called as? Okay, maybe I'll ask an even more simpler question. Does anyone know what I'm simulating? I'll type containment exactly, but I'll type containment doesn't make sense. It's actually I'll containment. Yes, you are right, Ajit. So this is what you call as the hot air, hot air containment and cold air containment systems. So hot air containment and cold air containment, HAC and CAC systems. So why is it called like that? And what is the idea? So for example, these here, right? These black boxes are nothing but computers. So these are called as rack type computers. So here, this is not a single desktop, like you, what you have. This is a rack. It basically looks like a bookshelf, but instead of books, you actually have computers, which are horizontal in nature. They have an horizontal architecture and the computers are like this. Now, the way the computers are aligned is you actually have cooling, cooling coming from the underneath, from the, from the floor of the data center. Cool, cold air is sucked in to the temperature into these computers and all the because of the processing hot air comes out right because if your computer is running for a while it's going to become hot and you will have hot air similarly the next row of data centers are set up such a way that the hot air comes this side and cold air is taken inside essentially making this gap this entire gap what you call as an hot air system. So this is called as hot air containment. Why do we do this? Well, the answer is actually quite simple, right? So what happens to hot air? Does it actually rises or does it settle down? What happens to hot air? Does it go up or does it come down? It rises, right? Because of buoyancy and because of lower density, right? So what you do is in the hot air, in the hot air containment system, right above in the ceiling, you create a, you create a duct fan, which basically sucks the air. So this way you're effectively removing heat. Similarly, cold air settles down and cold air is basically in this particular space long enough for it to be sucked in by the computers. So the hot, the hot oil containment and cold oil containment system is a very standard system that people use in use for thermal managing their data centers. Now, as far as cooling is concerned, you don't see it here, but this particular uh, case uses something called as the raised floor architecture, meaning the cooling air contains the duct underground and cooling air comes from the ground. It's actually pumped in, right? 
and these type of devices or these type of systems can be researched primarily uh, it's like forced convection yes that's correct so this <laughs> type of devices can be researched or these layouts can be researched mainly through computational fluid dynamics why because you need to understand that you know for example facebook or google right the calculations that they are running in these type of computers the queries that they are running in these type of computers is is worth way more that they cannot use it for testing right so they have to make sure that they limit the number of test cycles that they do so most of their work that they do is done using computers so they use something called as mental graphics they use mental graphics products or ansys ice pack to basically simulate something like this but you can also do this in open form or convert cfd fairly easily to get an idea about these type of problems and uh, what else okay the other type of uh, uh, what you call simulation that you can do is called as red reduced dimensional models so here the idea is very simple uh, these are all 1d models these are mainly designed what are some of the simulation softwares kedar you can use convert cfd in fact like i said uh, you know in in, a, in the next few minutes i'll be talking about the course that we have on hvac system analysis that i teach where we are using um, solid works flow simulation to design all of these things similarly you can use converge you can use open form you can use ansys fluent you can use ansys ice pack which is more preferred for these type of problems it doesn't matter because these simulations are actually quite easy to perform the thing that is actually complex is when you're simulating you know your pumps or moving parts that is when you need specialized cfd software if the if if there are no moving components pretty much anything can be used simulink can be used simulink can be used if you're doing reduced dimensional models or if you're developing control systems what does that mean so let us say that this is your um, space where you are trying to maintain cabin comfort right and let us say that i give you real time temperature data right so for example let us say you have you are in a room uh let us say you are in a room and then uh, 20 uh, like it could be your office room right or it could be a auditory it could be a conference room in your college just imagine this let us say that 20 or 30 people are coming in because of that the temperature in the room is going to increase up and down right let us say you monitor this data you have you put a temperature data and you get this temperature as a function of time you can feed that into a simulink model and you can see how all of your systems react because your control system entire control system can be built in simulink or matlab or even octave or pretty much any programming language and you can see how your system uh, reacts to these temperature changes like how long it takes to react right so for example if there is a 3 degree change in temperature how long does it take for the temperature to come back to normal for that reduced dimensional models are very very good because these are super fast you can run them in real time meaning you can run them in real time and you can also run them at real time multiplied by scaling factor or multiplication factor so these run very very fast you can do this in your laptop whereas if you are running a simulation like this like the data center uh, it looks a lot of it look it takes a lot of time it looks like the graphical programming lab view yeah uh, well sure a lot of softwares have these type of interfaces uh, you can pretty much lab view is also fine you can do system level simulations in a lab view as well okay all right all right guys so with that i would like to what time is it i think it's almost close to 1 hour yep we are 5 minutes away from the end of the presentation so with that guys i would like to you know uh, thank you all for uh, taking the time to attend this workshop hopefully you learned something about hvac systems and you learned how uh, different components in your typical hvac simulation systems are simulated using computational fluid dynamics uh you will all be getting a e verified certificate which will be mailed to you in 2 weeks and uh, along with that you will also be given a recording to this particular workshop at this point does anyone have any questions for example regarding the simulations that i showed does anyone have any questions or if you want me to repeat something again i would be happy to do that what is turbulence modeling equations uh, that's a great question so uh when you're doing cfd right so let me just maybe move on to something like this
So when you're, when you're basically setting up computational fluid dynamics, you are actually simulating uh, flow through a system, right? So for example, if you have a system like this, you are simulating the flow through this system. Hmm. Okay. And then just a second guys. Oh, okay. My bad. I was using the wrong draw tool. There we go. So this is perfect. So when you're simulating flow through a system, you basically need uh, your fundamental equations. So one is your continuity equation. And then you have your momentum equation, right? And then you have your energy equation. And in order for you to do CFD, you create something called as a computational mesh. All right. So when you create a computational mesh, um, what is, no, well, FVM and, FVM and turbulence modeling are not the same, right? So the computational meshing is just discretization. It can be done through finite difference method, finite element method, or finite volume method. It doesn't matter, right? So when you create a computational mesh, in each of these points, you are solving the continuity momentum and energy equation, all right? So now, given, now let us say your Reynolds number is 30,000. Right. If your Reynolds number, uh, if your Reynolds number is thirty thousand, then you will basically need cells that are roughly Reynolds number to the power three. That many number of cells is what you need to capture your boundary layers occur, uh, accurately. So, for example, you get a boundary layer, right? And these boundary layers is where turbulence is generated. Okay. So you will actually have to use that. And just by solving continuity, momentum, and energy equation, you can get this. And that is what you call it, call as a DNS simulation. It's called as a direct numeric simulation. So in other words, without a turbulence model, you can run this. But the problem is oftentimes, if you're using Reynolds number to the power three, that's so many number of cells, which you cannot afford to run. So what you basically do is you say that, hey, I can just afford only this many number of cells. But then in the near wall cells, that are the cells that are attached to the wall, you kind of, feed in the answer from experimental data by using something called as a turbulence model. And there are two types of turbulence model, basically uh, RANS, which is called as the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes approach and large eddy simulation. And within your RANS model, you have several options, but the most commonly used, which is found in everything, every, uh, Solver is called as the viscosity based methods for which you have a K epsilon, K omega, RNG K epsilon, and so on. And for Elias, you have your Smagrinsky model, dynamic structure model, and so on, which typically we don't talk about. So RAMS is based upon what you call as ensemble averaging or time averaging. And Elias is based upon spatial average. These topics might be a bit too hard for you to understand at this point. And these turbulence models, these are models, okay? So which means they are approximations. So these turbulence models kind of give you the answer by approximating it and uh, you get the answer. You get your turbulent quantities, which is which basically helps you calculate your shear stress, which calculates, say, your pressure losses, for example. Uh, okay, so Prakash, what is the step-by-step -step process to learn CFD? I don't have much knowledge on CFD, so I want to learn. So uh, Prakash, you know, as I mentioned in the start of the presentation, Skilllink provides courses where we teach computational fluid dynamics. In fact, I specifically teach multiple courses on CFD in our platform. So if you just wait for a little bit more time, I'll talk about the courses that we offer. I'll just answer the question that Mr. Ajit has asked. So Ajit has asked, what is a race floor model in 26th slide? Okay, so let me draw the drawing here. So for example, this is actually say a 2D representation of the hot oil and cold oil containment system. Okay, Ajit. So let us say that this is your hot oil, uh, cold oil, this is your hot oil, okay? So what you do is, <coughs> since this is your hot oil, um, I mean, after the computer has done a lot of work, it's going to, you know, send hot air 
through the fans and that's naturally going to rise up and you basically have suction here which basically takes all this hot air similarly on the cold side what you do is you have this is your floor and inside and then underground you basically have a passage and you have your crank you have your crank unit which is basically your air conditioning unit which is basically a big box which supplies cold air and these cold airs basically come through the cold air they basically do this they circulate here long enough because cold air is heavy so that your computers can just suck it in and then cool the equipment and this happens there is the ducts are present or the holes are present only in the cold aisles does it make sense ajit so this right here is called as the raised floor architecture i hope it i hope you understand that okay awesome all right guys so at this point uh, again thank you so much for uh, patiently listening me to speak and asking excellent questions